I believe this is one of the strongest discovery in psychiatry of the last 20 years. It's pretty radical. We are exploring the idea that we can develop new treatment options for psychiatric disorders that work through the immune system rather than through the nervous system. It is groundbreaking because for the first time we are demonstrating that depression is not only a disorder of the mind, in fact it's not even only a disorder of the brain, it's a disorder of the whole body. It is a really exciting advance and breakthrough. Every psychiatrist and every patient needs to be aware of this. This is a programme about betrayal by our fiercest protector. Our immune system should always have our backs, but we'll uncover the revelatory new evidence that it can turn and unleash an assault on the brain. I'm James Gallagher. And in this edition of Discovery from the BBC, we'll explore how these findings offer fresh prospects for treatment for mental illness. But just as importantly, they're also a challenge to the idea that psychiatric illness is all in the mind and to our own expectations that people just need to pull themselves together. I hate that phrase. Oh my goodness, if I could... I would, just as if someone had diabetes and their insulin, you know, they're, they're, those levels weren't working correctly. You wouldn't say, oh, snap out of it, stop having a hypo. <laughs> because your body just simply isn't producing the right chemicals. And it's exactly the same thing. It's just, for some reason, people don't feel as valid. Our journey begins seven years ago. Amid the skyscrapers of New York, one young woman's immune system was triggering her descent into madness. My name is Susanna Kahalen, and I am the author of Brain on Fire, My Month of Madness. So I was 24 at the time, and I was working as a general news reporter for the New York Post. When I started to kind of feel off, unlike myself, kind of general feeling of um, just t being very tired and unfocused. I remember repeating a lot, I just don't feel like myself. Susanna soon developed insomnia and wild mood swings, but that was just the beginning. I became increasingly psychotic. I started to hear things that weren't there. At one point, my boyfriend, Stephen, and I were at a restaurant in, our, in the neighborhood, and I started hearing people whispering my name, and I thought that everyone in the restaurant was staring at me. I full-on hallucinated. You know, paintings in my dad's apartment were alive. There's a railroad scene that he has in oil, and it seemed as if the smoke was coming out of the frame of the painting from the railroad scene. He has a bust of Abraham Lincoln in that, and that was following me with his eyes. And I barricaded myself in the bathroom and nearly jumped out of the window to escape my father. But I didn't, thanks to a Buddha statue by the sink that smiled at me. So clearly I was becoming a threat to myself and, a, and perhaps a threat to other people and something needed to happen. Susanna was admitted to hospital and ended up in a catatonic state. Doctors just didn't know what to do with her. Their best diagnosis was a schizoaffective disorder. But one of them suspected her immune system was the culprit, that its chemical weapons, antibodies, were attacking her brain. Such antibodies were first discovered just two years earlier. He did a brain biopsy, and the brain biopsy showed, you know, evidence of pretty extreme inflammation. And he also did a lumbar puncture, and he sent my spinal fluid to the one place in the world at the time that was testing for this newly discovered disease. That was at University of Pennsylvania by Dr. Joseph Dalmau. That came back positive for antibodies directed against the NMDA receptor in the brain. The immune system is supposed to attack hostile invaders such as viruses, but it can mess up. We're all familiar with that idea of autoimmune diseases when it's our own tissues that are being attacked. Multiple sclerosis and rheumatoid arthritis are just two examples. But when Susanna was in hospital, the idea of a rogue immune system causing psychosis was not well known. Dr Joseph Dalmau made the discovery just two years before. He calls it autoimmune encephalitis because of the swelling in the brain. 
for this particular disease, for anti-NMDA receptor encephalitis, I think that there is a, a general acceptance that this is an immune-mediated disease, so that means that uh, the disease is mediated by an attack of the immunological system in these patients against the brain, and that the antibodies play a substantial role in the cause of the symptoms, and of course that the antibodies also are very important biomarkers to make the diagnosis of this disease. Formally diagnosed autoimmune encephalitis comes with distinctive physical symptoms as well as psychosis. But some doctors believe many more cases of mental illness could be down to an aberrant immune system. I'm Professor Belinda Lennox. I'm a clinical senior lecturer in psychiatry at the University of Oxford. The first time I really got excited about this area was when I tested some patients who were under my clinical service in the first episode psychosis service in Cambridge and sent the blood off to the clinical testing laboratory here in Oxford and found some positive results and I thought initially that I must have missed patients with encephalitis. So I traced the patients, investigated them to see whether they might have some other kind of illness but they didn't and they were patients with diagnoses of schizophrenia who were really indistinguishable from the other patients in the clinical service. 16 different antibodies have now been detected and Belinda Lennox estimates one in every 10 patients first coming to doctors with psychotic symptoms could have antibodies targeting parts of their brain circuitry. Come on. Come on, A farm in the hills of the west of England. Oh, oh good boy. Hello. 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 You all right? Uh, nice ride. Lovely. <laughs> 21-year-old Charlie Watson lives here with his mum, Sarah. Charlie's a patient at Belinda's clinic, and while he's been diagnosed with bipolar disorder, he also has autoimmune antibodies in his blood. He's twice been admitted to hospital after psychotic episodes. The first was when he was 15, and the second last year at a music festival. For some bizarre reason, I thought that I, I could, like, not read minds, but, like, there was some sort of connection there that um, people could hear my thoughts or something. And it just felt really real. And the rest of that night, I sort of wandered off thinking that, like, everyone I bumped into could sort of hear my thoughts. But I thought it was kind of, like, really special. So there was, like, a euphoric feeling there. When I saw him come back from Glastonbury and I'd come back from work, and I looked at him and I saw his eyes. I knew immediately what, what it was. I recognised it. So for me, yeah, absolute fear, panic and desperation, really. I was completely scared of, like, mum, dad, and I was, like, smashing things in the house. I did hallucinate a bit. Well, I was, Dad calmed me down and we were sat on the sofa and I just remember seeing, like, weird sort of, faces coming off his face and it was just it was quite frightening and I didn't know what was going on and then the next thing I knew like the ambulance came and I had to go to hospital. Cases of psychosis that are caused by antibodies pose a challenge to doctors. They need to know if their patient could benefit from a therapy to correct a rogue immune system. Belinda Lennox showed me where they test blood samples from patients like Charlie. This is where we test for the antibodies in the patients. We see the patients in the clinic, a couple of floors below, and then we bring the samples up here to test for the antibodies in their blood. OK, you've lined one up for me under the microscope, so do you mind if I have a quick look? Yeah, have okay. a look down there. So I can see, a very scientific term, a lot of blobs, but they're all surrounded by like a ring of bright red. So what am I seeing there? The ring of bright red, those are the cells that are expressing the NMDA receptor and then the blobs are the antibodies in the patient's blood that are sticking to those receptors. So we know that that patient therefore has antibodies to the NMDA receptor. It's a positive test result and taken together with the clinical presentation, we would now offer immune treatments to that patient. So how do you stop the immune system rebelling and attacking the brain? We give treatments to get rid of the antibodies and then treatments to stop the antibodies coming back. 
So the treatments to get rid of the antibodies are mechanical treatments uh, like plasma exchange, where we filter somebody's blood to remove the antibodies, which are relatively large particles in the blood, and also intravenous immunoglobulins, which are produced from blood donations. They remove existing antibodies from people's blood, and then we give treatments to stop antibodies coming back, which are usually steroids or steroid-like drugs. This kind of treatment cured Susanna Cahalan and prevented her from being committed to a psychiatric ward. Belinda Lennox says it's helping many of her psychosis patients as well. We have been seeing improvements in those patients, getting better with immunotherapy who have not got better with antipsychotic drugs. However, we want to be cautious about these findings because they are potentially quite important for psychiatric practice. So we're about to start a blinded, placebo-controlled, randomised controlled trial of using these immune treatments in patients with psychosis and antibodies to hopefully show definitively that that is the approach that's required. This is cutting-edge science, and it's controversial. Doctors disagree about how big a role the immune system has in psychosis. But the rapidly evolving field does provide hope to patients like Charlie. They said that I had like really high levels of the antibodies that they see. The doctor that was in hospital, he said, like, look, Charlie, this could cure you. So I see it as like a long term sort of thing that's going to really benefit me. And if the science is out there, like, why wouldn't you just take it, really? It's really exciting for people like Charlie, who had several episodes of illness that have caused significant impact on his life, that even now, um, at a later stage, we can still find the antibodies and that we can still hopefully treat and remove them. And particularly the antibody that Charlie has, we have a really positive outlook for those that we think that if we take, get rid of those antibodies, they don't usually come back at all. So we're really optimistic that if we can treat him, that we will help. It's not hard to understand why they're all so keen for this to work. There's a lack of treatments for psychosis, the field has had no major breakthroughs for 50 years, and drug companies have largely pulled out of research. It's exactly the same problem in another mental illness. This one affects millions of people living with the second biggest cause of disability in the world. My depression gets so bad that I can't leave the bed, I can't leave the bedroom... I can't go downstairs and be with my partner and his two children. I can't have the television on. I can't have any noise, light. I have suicidal thoughts. I've self-harmed. I can't leave the house. And everything else just feels too much. Hayley Mason from Cambridgeshire is one of the 350 million people worldwide living with depression. Antidepressant drugs and psychological treatments like cognitive behavioural therapy help many people. But with so many who don't respond to existing therapies, some scientists are now exploring new territory, whether the immune system could be causing depression. I think we have to be quite radical. Professor Ed Bullmore, the head of psychiatry at the University of Cambridge, is at the forefront of this new approach. Recent history is telling us that if we want to make therapeutic breakthroughs in an area which remains you know, an incredibly important area in terms of you know disability and suffering if we want to do something in that area we've got to think differently and we've got to move quite radically away from the ways that we've done things in the past that have not worked out but here the parallels with psychosis end instead of looking at antibodies the focus is on the immune system causing inflammation in the body but how can that alter mood ed bullmore says you need to think back to the last time you had flu depression and inflammation often go hand in hand. If you have a flu, your body reacts to that, the immune system reacts to that, you become inflamed, and very often people find that their mood changes too, and their behaviour change. You know, they may become less sociable, more sleepy, more withdrawn, they may begin to have some of the kind of negative ways of thinking that are characteristic of depression, and all of that follows an infection. Ed Bullmore argues we don't just feel sorry for ourselves when we're sick, but that the chemicals involved in inflammation are directly affecting our mood. Inflammation's part of the immune system's response to danger. 
it's a hugely complicated process to prepare our body to fight off hostile forces. If inflammation's too low, then an infection can get out of hand. If it's too high, it causes damage. And for some reason, a third of depressed patients have consistently high levels of inflammation, like Haley. I actually do have raised inflammation markers. I think the normal is under 0.7 and mine's 40, and they still don't quite know why that is. It's coming up regularly on my blood tests over the last couple of years. There's now a patchwork quilt of evidence suggesting inflammation's more than something you simply find in some depressed patients, but it's actually the cause of their disease, that the immune system can alter the workings of the brain. Good morning, rheumatology. The Department of Rheumatology at Glasgow Royal Infirmary. Morning, Ed. Good Welcome. Morning. Nice to have you here in the clinic. Okay. So, um, tell me how you've been. Yeah, I've been generally very well, I would say. Uh, the Embryo's doing its Professor work. Ian McInnes's arthritis clinic is perhaps an unexpected place to discuss a revolutionary new idea in depression. But it was in clinics like this that doctors noticed something unusual. Rheumatoid arthritis is caused by the immune system attacking joints. And when patients were given precise anti-inflammatory drugs that calmed down specific parts of the immune response, their mood improved. What we've observed is when we give these therapies targeting inflammatory proteins, we see a fairly rapid increase in sense of well-being, mood state improving quite remarkably, often disproportionately compared to the amount of inflammation that we can actually see in their joints. It suggests that patients were not simply feeling happier as they were in less pain, but that something more profound was going on, a finding backed up by brain scans. We scanned the brains of people with rheumatoid arthritis. We then gave them a very specific anti-inflammatory immune-targeted therapy, and then we imaged again afterwards. And what we're starting to see is that when we give anti-inflammatory medicines, we actually see quite remarkable changes in the, the neurochemical circuitry in the brain. The brain pathways involved in mediating depression were favourably changed in people in whom we had given immune interventions. One possible explanation is inflammatory chemicals enter the brain and prevent the production of serotonin. That's a key neurotransmitter linked to our mood. To hear more, I met Carmini Periente, a professor of biological psychiatry at King's College London, who's been piecing together the evidence on inflammation and depression for 20 years. Maybe 30 to 40 percent of depressed patients have high level of inflammation. And in these people, we think that inflammation is part of the causal process. So the evidence supporting this idea, for example, is that high level of inflammation are present even if someone is not depressed, but is at risk of becoming depressed. We know from longitudinal studies that if you have high levels of inflammation today, you are at higher risk of becoming depressed over the next weeks or months, even if you're perfectly well today, the day that I measure your inflammation. Carmini Periente took me to the laboratory where he does his work. He's shown that not only are depressed patients more likely to have high levels of inflammation, but those with an overactive immune system are also less likely to respond to antidepressants. This is a big deal, because a third of patients don't get any benefit from the current drug treatments. This is a fully automated robotic system that allows us to handle uh, hundreds of samples at the same time. Um, when we measure, for example, markers of inflammation in the saliva, we have multiple samples for every individual throughout the day. And so we end up with thousands and thousands of samples by the end of the study. So these systems allow us to uh, separate and each individual samples and analyze it in a fully automatic way. And once you have that information, what do you do with it? So the things that we can measure in the saliva are stress hormones like cortisol, um, we can also measure markers of inflammation in the saliva and then we look at the correlation between this level of hormones and whether the patient is feeling depressed, uh, whether the patient is responding to, a, to the antidepressant or is not responding to the antidepressant. But the immune system, which responds to infection, doesn't really seem to fit the usual story of depression. Take Jennifer Streeting, 
a trainee midwife who traces her mental health problems back to when she was 14. My nan had passed away the year before and my mum had had breast cancer. And I think if you ask my therapist now, she kind of puts it down to kind of grief and not really kind of dealing with that at the time. But having my sisters were very young at the time and I think there was just a lot going on. Carmini Periente argues it's actually these awful moments in our lives that change our immune system, priming it to increase the risk of depression years later. We think that the immune system is the key mechanism by which early life events produce this long-term effect and this increased risk of developing depression. We have some data showing that adult individuals who have a history of early life trauma, even if they've never been depressed, they have an activated immune system. So they have a state of at risk, if you like, which then will lead to an increased risk of depression if this individual meets another life events later in life. As in psychosis, the hope is that drugs targeting the immune system will provide much needed treatments for patients, particularly for those like Jen, who seem to have tried them all. I had sertraline, I had Prozac, it was another one that I had. I got started on citalopram. He put me on geloxetine and then I got put on metazapine as well. So I was on three at one point. So it's totally trial and error. And I think it is because we, we, we're not able to predict right from the beginning whether someone will respond to one of the antidepressants that is routinely prescribed. But we think that by measuring information in the blood, we'll actually be able to identify individuals that do require more complex, uh, intensive antidepressant treatment, perhaps a combination of more than one antidepressant or antidepressant and anti-inflammatory, go straight into a more complex treatment. But where will those anti-inflammatories come from? The world's largest medical research charity, the Wellcome Trust, has brought together universities and the pharmaceutical industry. Their aim is to consolidate the evidence to accelerate the field. Ultimately, they want to find new treatments for depression and develop tests to identify those who will benefit. Cambridge's Ed Bullmore is leading the consortium, but I met him at his other employer, the company GlaxoSmithKline, GSK. Hello, James. We're standing in the uh, immunoinflammation laboratory at the heart of GSK. Okay, so there's one, two, three, four, five rows of lab benches, kit everywhere, scientists busy at work. What, what's going on here? This is a lab where people are developing new molecules, developing new drugs that we hope will be effective medicines for inflammatory disorders. So how long do you think it's going to be from a, a lab bench like this one to, to a patient somewhere that they're actually going to treat depression through the immune system? Right. Well, if you start in a lab like this, which is uh, working at the very earliest stages of drug development, and you think, how long is it going to take to get to a patient? That is quite a long time. It's typically about 15 years or so. But I think one of the exciting things about immunopsychiatry as an approach to disorders like depression is that because of the success of immunology in other areas of medicine, there are already many drugs that are far beyond this stage of development. They may already be licensed or in late-stage clinical trials, uh, and if we could find the right rationale to treat a subgroup of patients with depression with one of those drugs that are already uh, in development, delivering a medicine that might make a difference to patients could be much shorter. Raiding the cupboards is already showing signs of success. Those early clues in arthritis mean the anti-inflammatory drug serucumab is now being trialled in depressed patients. So are drugs targeting the immune system about to transform the treatment of depression? I don't think they're going to be a panacea. I don't think we're talking about a scenario in future where every patient that goes to their GP with symptoms of depression is going to be offered an anti-inflammatory drug. I don't think that makes sense. And frankly, I think that sort of blockbuster, one-size-fits-all approach to development of drugs for psychiatry has not been helpful to us in the past, and it's one of the reasons I think that we've failed uh, in recent decades to discover new treatments. We have to take a more personalised or stratified approach because that's the strategy that's been successful in other areas of medicine, and that also respects the fact that not everybody who is depressed is depressed for the same reason. So what we will need to do is to develop blood tests or biomarkers that we can measure in patients that have a depression 
and we can use the biomarker data that we get from those tests to predict which patients are most likely to respond to a novel anti-inflammatory drug. And then we're beginning to match the patient to the treatment more precisely. We are probably at the beginning of a revolution in the treatment of depression by bringing the right anti-inflammatory into clinical use, but that will require some time. And we don't want people to change their medication or start combination of medication without discussing with the doctor. Depression is an illness that affects hundreds of millions of people. Even if anti-inflammatories help just a small proportion of them, that would still be a huge number of patients. But if immunotherapy does become a success, its biggest impact may be on society and the way we think about the condition. I'm James Gallagher, and this has been Discovery from the BBC. If there was a way to say that depression was a physical problem, I think that would make a massive difference. I think it would help a lot of people. People would treat depression as not something that's sort of made up going on in the head it would be seen as a genuine condition if if you could say I actually have chronic depression I have medical markers I think it would validate a lot of people's feelings it is groundbreaking because for the first time we are demonstrating that depression is not only a disorder of the mind in fact it's not even only a disorder of the brain it's a disorder of the whole body Thank you.